Movie theaters across the country remain empty this weekend because the screens are filled with Blue Beetle, the perfect example of a waste of time. There isn't anything inherently wrong with Blue Beetle. It's just a derivative, by-the-numbers, trope-filled standard piece of fare that's idiotically but inoffensively written. And it happens to have a new coat of a Latino-inspired paint on it in a desperate grasp at becoming something unique and fresh. It's basically a mashup of scenes from a bunch of other superhero origin movies, except not done nearly as well, and feels like a slog to get through. If you've made it to my video, that means you've dodged all of the representation matters folks, and you want to know why the movie isn't worth watching. Because this is, apparently, the first Latino superhero, and according to WB, that's the reason why you should go see it, because there's nothing else new or unique here. Yes, Jaime Reyes is the first Latino superhero, as long as you ignore Miles Morales, who's half Hispanic, or America Chavez, who debuted in last year's Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, or Moon Knight casting Latin actors to play Mark Spector's family, and Mark himself being played by Oscar Isaac, who's Guatemalan and Cuban, or Sunspot from The New Mutants, or Robbie Reyes, the ghost writer from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Vibe from The Flash TV series. Yes, just like the majority of forward-thinking marketing techniques, the marketing department develops amnesia when they need to present their bland, regurgitated product as something that's the first of its kind. Latinos rejoice because you finally have your own bug-shaped mech that farts. Unfortunately, reality has struck Blue Beetle. It earned a horrific $25 million domestic opening weekend and has hit only $50 million worldwide so far. This is a trend for Warner Brothers DC properties. Since the release of Birds of Prey in 2020, there have been seven DCEU releases. Know how many of them have Oppenheimered? All seven. Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman 1984, The Suicide Squad, Black Adam, Shazam 2, The Flash, and now Blue Beetle. Every one of them lost the studio considerable money or flat out bombed at the box office. Out of the bunch, Blue Beetle joins Birds of Prey as the most reasonably budgeted of the lot, both in the $100 million range, so Blue Beetle might end up being an underperformer rather than an absolute flop, and we'll know in the coming weeks. Originally meant to be an HBO Max direct-to-streaming release, it was pushed forward into a theatrical release, and according to the director, When I came into the project, the mandate was, at the time, everything goes to HBO Max, right? But I'm like, it can't be that the first time that we have a Latino superhero front and center, not just a Latino playing a hero, but where he's a Latino, his family is Latino. I was like, it cannot just live on streaming. He has to go to theaters. The thing is, Blue Beetle feels like it is a direct-to-streaming movie at best. And at worst, it feels like it belongs on the CW network and part of the Arrowverse. It had to be for social credibility purposes to put this in theaters. And its recycled superhero origin tropes means it has nothing else to advertise itself as other than the first Latino superhero to get his own movie. The box office returns tell a tale that, well, that's not enticing enough. If this is a Latino version of Black Panther or the white woman's Barbie, it lacked what those movies had. Uniqueness. The saving grace is the director was good at handling the budget. And we can't all have an Angel Soto around, but today's sponsor can help you with your budget. With my move from a 9 to 5 to YouTube full time, I needed to take a much closer look at my monthly spending. Rocket Money is an all in one app that helps you save more and spend less. With Rocket Money's help, you can improve your financial health and achieve all of your finance goals by canceling unwanted subscriptions, lowering bills, monitoring your credit score, setting budgets, and it provides a holistic view of your finances. I've signed up for free trials for streaming services so many times I'd lost track of how many I was paying for. The Rocket Money app helped me safely and securely identify recurring charges and cancel unwanted subscriptions, all with just a tap. I also like using the app for setting my budget. You can set it to automatically monitor your spending by category, get friendly notifications when you've exceeded them, and visualize your spend to earn ratio by month, quarter, or year. This all helps lower those bills. By simply uploading a photo and tapping a button, Rocket Money can negotiate your bills for you, from internet service to cell phone. Download Rocket Money and unlock even more features with Premium. Go to rocketmoney.com slash themoviecynic or click the link right in the video description. The movie kicks off with a mean white lady played by a completely phoned-in Susan Sarandon who's running Stark Industries. I mean Cord Industries and she's uncovered some sort of ancient alien device called the Scarab. We jump to our lead character, Peter Parker, 
I mean, Jaime Reyes, who's returning home to Palmera City after graduating college. After the one joke in the movie that made me laugh, when Jaime asks a stranger how he looks and he responds, like you're six figures in debt, he's picked up by his family, who inform him over tacos that his father had a heart attack and they've been in the process of losing their home while Jaime was gone. This is a moment where I was kind of surprised the movie was towing the lines between stereotypes and authenticity. I mean, this is one of a number of scenes that were comically almost out of a Speedy Gonzales cartoon. But anyway, we'll just run with this. Jaime wants to help his family, so his sister gets him a job working at White Lady Susan Sarandon's mansion. If you're wondering why I'm pointing out that she's white so many times, I'm just following the movie's lead because it lets us know a number of times. While at the mansion, Jaime sees Susan, who's preoccupied talking on the telephone. When he yells hello to a woman who's already busy in another conversation and who doesn't notice him because her attention is focused elsewhere, Jaime's sister pipes up and says rich white people act like we don't even exist. Okay. While his sister is taking a dump, Jaime continues prying in other people's business when he inserts himself into an argument between Susan Sarandon and her character's niece, Jenny. Susan promptly fires Jaime and his shitting sister. On the way out, Jaime asks Jenny if she's okay, and she retaliates with fierce independence, shouting that she doesn't need chivalry. And when she's eyeballed by the sister, she tells Jaime to text her, and he can come in to an interview for another job working for Korg Industries. He does just that, and the next day at their headquarters, he tells a woman at the front desk that he has an appointment to meet with Jenny. And the front desk person keeps calling him Jamie instead of Jaime, even after he corrects her multiple times, because that's reality. Jaime then sees Jenny, who somehow managed to sneak into a top secret part of the laboratory there, and steal the scarab by placing it in a fast food box. She's discovered Susan Sarandon is turning it into a weapon, and she needs to get it out of there. Jaime absolutely loses his fucking mind when he sees Jennifer in the elevator, and decides waiting to be told she's ready like a normal person isn't for him, and literally chases her down. Even though this meeting was scheduled, she looks shocked that he's there and tells him she doesn't have time. Unlucky for her, the alarm is going off. They know the scarab is missing. And this moron decides to stick the scarab with Jaime, someone she doesn't know whatsoever because fuck it, what's the worst that could happen? Well, they could rip off the body horror elements from the anime and low-budget US adaptation of The Giver, for one thing. The movie then goes into Iron Man mode. You remember the scene when he was discovering how to use the suit, right? Well, same thing here. Jaime goes to find Jenny and gets some dang answers around here. And he saves her from Susan Sarandon's goons. Jenny explains that the Scarab is a symbiotic alien device, and it's chosen Jaime as its host. They need to go get a smartwatch that was owned by her father because the plot needs to extend the movie's length, and they break into Stark Industries, I mean Cord Industries, to do so. They are confronted by Susan Sarandon's number one henchman, who has a knockoff version of the Blue Beetle suit, and his flunkies start shooting at Jenny in an attempt to find the scarab, because the best way to find something that's missing is to kill the one person that knows where it is. Jaime and number one henchman duke it out in a shitty fight scene that was reminiscent of the lameness that was Whiplash vs. Iron Man and War Machine in Iron Man 2, where Subboss 1 tells Jaime the totally not overused or corny line that reinforces the theme of the movie, when he says his love for his family is what makes him weak. Wonder if that will come back around. They escape Whiplash, I mean Blue Beetle villain, and use the watch they stole to activate Jenny's father's secret laboratory. There, they discover that her father was a vigilante calling himself Blue Beetle, which is a sentient device named Jarvis. I mean, Kajida. The story needs to move, so they notice Susan Sarandon flying in a helicopter towards Jaime's home. He forces the Scarab to fly him home where his family is under siege by Susan Sarandites, and his father has a heart attack and dies. And I honestly cannot help it, but I fucking lost it laughing here because the acting was just so damn awful from the dad and the sister. It's just pure cheese bordering on cringe. Thankfully, there was no one in my theater with me, so my laughter didn't interfere with anyone's cinema-going experience. I'm a great patron. Anyway, Jaime's all distracted now, so the Sarandites capture him and incapacitate the suit that seemed literally impervious to everything until the plot needed it to not be anymore. He's taken to an island fortress in Cuba, and his family rallies with Jenny to help him, with particular help from his grandmother, who was apparently a rebel in her formative years, as she has no problem wielding a machine gun like she's Blaine in Predator. Jenny and Jaime's family break into the top secret fortress base thing using Jenny's father's blue beetle mech. 
a giant bug-shaped machine that farts as part of its weaponry. Because that's really cool. And Jaime has a moment with his father in the ether, like in this weird mix from the father-son scene in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and the ethereal plane when T'Challa meets his father in Black Panther. And this weird thing plays out where Jaime's reaching out to touch fingers with the blue beetle suit, like a Michelangelo painting, but it comes off really goofy and it's during one of the few heartfelt scenes in the movie, so it's this weird, confusing mix of cringe and good acting. And Jaime wakes up, but the plot needs the suit not to work for right now, so it's rebooting for whatever reason. Jaime escapes, but not before the sub-villain's suit goes full Ironmonger from Iron Man 1. Eventually, the suit snaps out of it when the plot says it's needed, and Jaime and the suit go on a killing spree, killing a shit ton of guards. Jaime and Subboss end up duking it out like it's the ending of Iron Man 1 all over again, and Iron Man uses his repulsor beam from his arc reactor in his chest. I mean, Blue Beetle uses his repulsor beam from his chest piece, and when Blue Beetle's about to finish him off, he reminds the villain of the theme of the movie. His family doesn't make him weak, it makes him strong. I love my mama very much. Now you know that. The suit decides for Jaime that he can't kill this guy, removing any drama from the scene at all because Jaime is stripped of autonomy, and the story decides to let him go since killing isn't what they do, even though the suit and Jaime just murdered like 20-something guards 10 minutes earlier, but <laughs> whatever, right? Then, in another weird twist of morality, the suit is totally fine with the sub-boss killing Susan Sarandon's character by setting his suit to self-destruct. So yeah, the movie might be confused on the moral high ground conundrum, but it's just a silly movie, we can just consume the product, right? The biggest issue with Blue Beetle is that it's not very good, but it's also not absolutely terrible. It's far from the worst superhero-related movie or TV show we've gotten over the last couple of years. But this is a theatrical release, and I have to ask myself, would I recommend you go to the theater and pay upwards of $15 for a ticket? It's relatively family-oriented, so say a mom and dad bring their two kids to the theater, get everyone something at the concessions, and drop over $100 for a couple hours out to see this? Absolutely not, I would not recommend you do that. Like I pointed out in the plot breakdown, this movie is just a bunch of standard tropes and cliches like a weird mutation of classic moments from superior films. You'll frequently feel like it's ripping or riffing off of a Spider-Man movie, frequently feel the effects of Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man franchise. There's bits of anime thrown in with the Giver, and there are throwaway scenes that feel like they're from Black Panther or Guardians of the Galaxy. Mixing a bunch of ideas together and creating an amalgamation that's something completely unique isn't a bad idea. When you say a hero is a mix of Spider-Man, Iron Man, and Black Panther, the possibilities are intriguing, at least. But what Blue Beetle does is just jump from a Spider-Man ripoff scene, to an Iron Man ripoff scene, to a Giver ripoff scene. The family matters and their tight-knit nature were a highlight of the film, even if it was driven home like a hammer to a nail. Not every member of the cast is a gifted actor, but moments between Jaime and his father were well done, even if they were undercut by weird-ass imagery sometimes. The theme about the importance and power of family is nice, but it's done through cliché dialogue and family-centered scenes that remind you of the same by-the-numbers family fair you've seen in a thousand other films and shows. If the marketing didn't make it obvious this is a very Latino-driven film, and the filmmakers clearly hoped the Latino flavor to the recycled family formula would be enough to set the movie apart, but just like everything else in this movie, it's tired and we've seen it so much. The dialogue and the basic story seem like something on par with the recent Spider-Man Lotus fan film. And yeah, it gets that on the nose sometimes. There's a point where the suit tells you symbiotic systems shutting down, like, just in case you forgot it's a symbiotic relationship, guys. Or the film seeing what heights of cringe one can reach when Jaime's uncle is talking about Latinos and that it's about time we had a hero of our own. The weird thing about this movie is that it probably would have fared better if it had gone straight to streaming on Max. I understand the desire to get it in theaters for the brownie points of having a Latino superhero lead for the first time, but this is the first film of James Gunn's DCU, and this cinematic universe is going to start off with a total bomb. You wouldn't think it could get worse than how Shazam 2 performed earlier this year, opening to less than fucking Morbius. But Blue Beetle's awful $25 million domestic opening shows people just do not care about whatever is happening with DC movies right now. James Gunn is partially to blame for their performance, with his announcement of a DC reboot making people feel like the films on the calendar simply didn't matter. So why bother going to see them? 
I think that's a PR issue that I hope isn't a sign of how Gunn is going to manage the DCU moving forward. It was a misguided move, and it's going to be interesting to see how Aquaman 2 performs. It's also a sign for how people care about this rebooted DCU. With the announcement that this is the first film of the new universe, people just didn't give a shit. Since the Blue Beetle movie takes a lot of cues from Iron Man and Spider-Man, I find it curious that James Gunn would decide this would be the first DCU movie. It's a strange way to kick off a new universe. Blue Beetle is low on the totem pole of superheroes, and even though Iron Man wasn't the household name when it kicked off the MCU, the Iron Man character was going to play a major role in the MCU moving forward since he's the leader of the Avengers. Blue Beetle isn't destined to play a major role in the DCU, even if he got a sequel or two. He'd be more of an Ant-Man at best. And man, this movie would die to have Quantum Mania box office numbers, I'm sure. So is it not just a sign that people didn't care about Blue Beetle, but that they might not care much about this new DCU either? At least not until a major player like Superman Legacy comes out? There are a lot of contributing factors to the empty seats in the theaters for Blue Beetle. The decision to move from streaming to theatrical was a big one, but the fact that it was a streaming title first tells you what kind of faith they had in the project. It's starring unknown actors for a relatively unknown hero, and to any general audience member, the film's going to feel incredibly familiar and exceedingly hollow. That kind of film production gets more of a pass when something is streaming. You're sitting in your own home, but in the present day, making a decision to watch something in the theater can be an expensive proposition for people and make them much less forgiving of spending money to watch something mid-tier. You'll be forgiven for thinking word of mouth is good. I've always found cinema score to be a good indicator of how a movie is going to perform at the box office and with audiences. And this movie received a B plus. That sounds okay, but with cinema score, you always need to round down a couple notches because they test the major fans who come out on opening night, aka the people who will be more forgiving. Adjusting for that, a B plus cinema score means more like a C to a C plus, which is, in my opinion, what this movie deserves. Maybe more like a C minus for me, but close enough. It's not worth recommending to anyone to see this bland nothing burger in theaters. Wait for it to come out on streaming, and it might be worth a night in. GG's.